All right. Our study of the Gospel of Matthew finds us returning once again to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. So if you would, let me encourage you to grab your Bibles and turn to our passage for this morning, found in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 20. <clears throat> and like we have in weeks past, we're going to run across some more statements and expressions that we're somewhat familiar with. They, they're things that have been kind of tossed around in our culture, and, and we sometimes use them, although they're often lifted out of the context in which Jesus originally used them. And because we have a tendency to take these things out of context, we miss and misunderstand his original point. Now, I'm not going to share all of them with you until after I pray. But to give you just a small preview of things yet to come here, using the tool of alliteration, we will be talking about pathways, prophets, and fruit. <laughs> you see, I decided to keep, just to keep it all together, I'd use P as a silent letter there. Now, I, I suppose upon further reflection, I could have used the word produce, but where's the fun in that? Come on. Anyway, that's what we're going to do. So with all of that being said, let's take a moment to pray and we'll look at what Jesus says here this morning. Oh, holy God and our Father in heaven, while we gather today for worship and praise, we are very thankful for this privilege that we share. We are your children. It's amazing to think about that, but we are your children and it is a joy to be reunited for these moments each week to share with each other and especially with you. So we thank you for making all of this possible for us. And this morning as we open up your word to consider some more of Jesus' teaching, we pray that you will help us to understand and apply what he says. Through the presence and activity of your Holy Spirit, give to each one of us exactly what you decide is best. And we pray that when we leave this place here this morning, we will be better prepared to participate in your kingdom even as we encounter the world around us. And together we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Matthew chapter 7. And at this particular point in his Sermon on the Mount, after spending two and a half chapters describing what it looks like to be a child of your Father in heaven, showing us what a life, uh, what a life which seeks first God's kingdom and righteousness looks like, Jesus brings us to the fork in the road. And I'm not talking about the one that Yogi Berra talked about, where you, when you come to a fork in the road, you take it. He's talking about a fork in the road where you must make a choice between two options of two different pathways. Have you ever run across an intersection like that? I mean, while you're out and about, you, you've come to this place where proceeding onward requires that you either go left or right. Now, I know I have, and, and especially, it, it's unnerving when you come to a place where you're not familiar. It, it's a place where you've never been before, and you're trying to figure out, okay, where do I go next? I can remember when we were serving a church out in Kansas, uh, western Kansas, out in the very, very flat part of the state, uh, there were times or two where I'd go out to, you know, try to visit some people, see some friends or whatever out there in the flatland. And in order to go there, you have to get directions. And I mean, I can remember it just being totally unnerving because out here in Colorado, you've got major landmarks. You can kind of tell which direction is west and east and north and south. But out there in the flatland, it's easy to get turned around. So I'd be out there surrounded by nothing but fields as I drove down a lonely road and I'd come to an intersection with a choice to make, to either go left or to go right. And for some reason, it wasn't completely uncommon for intersections like that to be marked by one tree all by itself. In fact, that would be a part of the directions I'd have been given, turn of the tree. And the first time I remember them talking about this, I thought that they were absolutely insane because growing up in Western Colorado, there are trees everywhere. That seems like terrible advice. But no, that would be a part of the directions. Turn at the tree. But out there on the Kansas farmland, surrounded by miles and miles of farm ground, 
It's not common to see trees, and so when I finally saw the tree, I knew that I was still on track. But when I finally got to that intersection, the big question then had to do with which, which direction. Was I supposed to turn right or turn left? And not wanting to get lost, I always wanted to make the correct choice. Now getting back to Jesus' teaching here this morning, it, we discover that he wants us to make sure that as his disciples, we go the right way. Only Jesus doesn't give us directions to a, a physical intersection. Instead, he describes this figurative, spiritual intersection that we find ourselves at. And while we all will proceed down the road in one direction or another, he always wants us to be prepared to go the right direction. But as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, determining the right direction requires that we exercise discernment. Now, if you were with us back, uh, back then a couple weeks ago, you might remember that this concept was introduced in the context of Jesus' words about judgment. And wanting to kind of re-familiarize myself with this idea of discernment, I thought that, you know, like it, it's good to do with a lot of words that are a little obscure, that I'd go to the dictionary, namely the New Oxford American Dictionary that was on my computer. And the entry did not disappoint. It, it was perfect because it only included two, de two definitions there. Two simple definitions. And the first said that discernment is the ability to judge well. The ability to judge well. Now, as we considered earlier on there in chapter 7, Jesus forbid a particular kind of judgment. He forbid condemning judgment. It is not our responsibility to determine who is qualified to go to heaven and who has to go to hell. And I am so thankful that God did not give us that decision to make. And if we did make such a judgment, you might say that that is not judging well. That is not exercising discernment at all. So if discernment does not include condemning other people, what is it? Well, that's where the second definition comes in. And I loved how they divided this thing out, how they described this. In the second definition, it said, in Christian contexts, it's the perception in the absence of judgment with a view to obtaining spiritual guidance and understanding. In other words, to use some of Jesus' previous teaching in the sermon, discernment involves seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness in order to know where to go, what to do, and how to live. And as we get to Jesus' teaching in our passage right here this morning, this fork in the road requires that we exercise discernment to make sure that we select the right option, the correct option. So let's read through the passage in its entirety, and then we'll unpack a couple of observations from what Jesus has to say here. Matthew 7, starting in verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, he says. For the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. Be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So you'll recognize them by their fruit. Now, as I said before, I'd like to make a couple of important observations from Jesus' words here this morning. And the first is that we have a choice as to which road we take. As Jesus describes the two, it's not hard to see that there is an obvious best choice. Of course, that's the one that he commands his disciples to choose. But I think that it's worth our time this morning to look closely at both of our options. And Jesus gives us some great adjectives to describe both of them. So let's start with the first of the two, the more popular of the two, the popular road. 
This is the one with the easiest access. Everyone and their dog wants to take this road. And the word that gets translated here in most of our Bibles as broad or easy can also be used to describe something that is spacious. Several weeks ago, uh, my family and I went and traveled down to the Houston area to attend the wedding of a daughter of some of our closest friends. And, and being the fifth largest metropolis in the United States, you can probably imagine, if you haven't been there, just how big the highways are. Uh, some of them are just massive, you know, in places where there's six or seven, up, even up to 10 w- lanes wide. And as we headed to the airport at three in the morning on the way back home, we were fortunate that I-10 was not as busy as it usually is during the day. And taking advantage of the reduced traffic, the Uber driver who was driving, driving myself and three of our kids really put his foot into it. I mean, we, we ended up leaving after Renee and the Uber that had the other three kids in it, and somehow or another, we managed to beat them to the airport by five minutes. <laughs> I mean, he was flat out booking it. Anyway, with the, with the traffic being as thin as it was there on I-10 that morning, uh, it gave me a good view of just how spacious this highway really is. It is able to carry thousands upon thousands upon thousands of cars and their passengers. So when I read about how wide and broad the road Jesus describes is, this is the image that comes to my mind. And there are many who go through it, Jesus says. But brothers and sisters, that's not a good thing because this popular, wide, broad, spacious road is one that Jesus tells us leads to destruction. The word that Jesus uses here is one that means to be destroyed by being entirely cut off what could have or should have been. You see, the broad road, which is not marked by a pursuit of God's kingdom or his righteousness, leads us farther and farther away from God. And since God alone is the author of life, if we choose the path that separates us further and further from him, we will also ultimately cut ourselves off from the eternal life that only he can provide. So while that broad, spacious road might seem like a great option at the time, it ultimately leads us to an unfavorable destination, eternal death. But thankfully, there's another road available to us, which is also the unpopular road. And it is very, very different. Look again at how Jesus describes it. There at the end of verse 14, he says that it has a narrow gate, and the road is difficult. Whereas the road leading to being completely cut off from God is a wide, broad, spacious superhighway, the unpopular road that Jesus now paints a picture of and he points his disciples to is really not much more than a footpath. That word that the Christian Standard Bible translates as difficult, your Bible might say narrow or small, is one that literally means to be compressed. In other places in the New Testament, it it also gets described as trouble or distress or affliction that some people endure for the sake of the kingdom. So no wonder this footpath is unpopular and uncrowded. But even more than it being challenging to travel, there is only one way to get on it. The gate, one gate. In another place in the gospel, as it was recorded by the apostle John, Jesus tells us that he himself is the only point of access to this trail. In John 14, 6, Jesus tells us plainly, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. On the broad superhighway leading to destruction, anything goes. There are many ways to get on it. That's why it's so popular. You can get on that broad, spacious, crowded road through any God or religion or belief system that you want. 
It doesn't matter who you are or what you choose to do with your life. You can be rich or poor. You can, be, you can worship whomever or whatever you want. You can act however you like. You can take your pick of political parties or sexual orientation. You can be a pleasant person and a nice person, or you can be selfish and evil. You can be a pacifist, a communist, a socialist, a capitalist. It doesn't matter. You can be whatever you want to be doing whatever you want to do. It's a free for all. There are no restrictions for the broad road leading to destruction. All are able to get onto that superhighway. And it takes no effort to go through any spot you'd like in that wide gate to start on your journey. But the unpopular road, the constricted footpath leading to eternal life, can only be accessed through Jesus Christ. No one comes to the Father except through me, he says. And clearly, this narrow gate and this constricted path is the best choice. Why would Jesus, com why else would Jesus command us to enter and travel it? But in addition to the observation that we have this choice to make as to whether or not we go one way or the other, I think that it's also important that we take note that Jesus also points out that those we consider to be our leaders influence our decision. Look again at his words in verse 15. Be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. Now, our, this is one of those statements that our culture has been quick to grab a hold of, and this image of wolves being in sheep's clothing. And it's a great way to describe people who appear to be normal and harmless, but who actually are ones with malicious intent. And of course, this image can be applied to all sorts of different places, whether it be politics or business or families or even churches. But it is imperative that we remember that the context of Jesus' use of this image is in his discussion with the true two roads that lead to either death or life. Now, as I've prayed my way through this message this morning, I've been reminded too often that there is a very real enemy who is bound and determined to lead as many people as possible to being eternally cut off from God. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus calls him a thief who comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But to us, the enemy doesn't outwardly reveal his intent to wipe us out. If he did, there would be a greater chance that people would run away from that broad superhighway to just crowd that narrow highway. But no, the enemy's approach is much more subtle as he disguises himself and his activity and even his servants in such a way that people want to follow him down the broad road to, to destruction. As the Apostle Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 11, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no great surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. So the big question has to do with how do we recognize these false prophets, these ravaging wolves who outwardly look like harmless sheep? Well, shifting to another valuable metaphor, Jesus gives us the tools that we need to evaluate our leaders, to help us discern whether the people we are following are going to spiritually lead us down the right road. And it all comes down to examining fruit, the fruit of our leaders. As he says in verse 18, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. So, for example... A good tree, like a peach tree, cannot produce bad fruit, like a banana. <laughs> and a bad tree, like a coconut palm tree, can't produce good fruit like apples. 
I know that my examples here are a matter of my own personal taste. I just don't like bananas and coconut. They're, to me, they're not worth scraping off the bottom of my shoes. <laughs> you guys can be wrong if you'd like. But at the very least, those particular fruits help me identify which trees need to be cut down. And as we examine the fruit of our leaders, we can also determine which ones are worth following and which ones we need to be avoid following. We need to avoid following. So what fruit are we looking for? Well, I'd like to suggest for you two particular passages to help you get started. But by way of disclaimer here, before we get into them, let me quickly share that even good, healthy trees occasionally do still exhibit some bad and rotten fruit. So it's good for us to keep in mind that the people who will lead us along the narrow path of righteousness are still sinners who sometimes miss the mark and reveal some bad fruit. That being said, when it comes to our examination of the fruit in the lives of our leaders, it's important that we pay close attention to his or her overall character and not just the occasional less than healthy fruit that they will sometimes exhibit. Anyway, the two passages to help you get started examining the fruit of your spiritual leaders. And the first comes from Paul's letter to the Galatian churches in Galatians 5, 22 through 23 where he says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the fruit of the Spirit. These are the things that mark the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. So if a person's character is consistently marked by these traits, we are better able to discern that he or she is someone who shares the life-giving relationship of God through Jesus Christ. But on the other hand, if his or her life is seriously deficient in these areas, you probably need to rethink whether or not you should be following his or her leadership. Now, the second passage I'd like to point you to expands on the first item in Paul's list of the, list of the fruit of the Spirit. And what better place to talk about love than the love chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Now, all of the chapter is worth reading and studying, like all of Scripture, especially uh, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. All three of those chapters are worth talking about. But for this morning, we'll just narrow it down to the first uh, verses 4 through 8. Where Paul says that love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, it is not boastful, it's not arrogant, it's not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not irritable, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. The spiritual leaders who are worth following will especially have the character that is marked by these aspects of love. As they should be, those who lead us to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness will be ones who are setting aside their own selfish concerns and agendas. They will speak the truth and they will exercise patience and kindness with those who are following them. These things and others are the kind of fruit that we must be examining in the people we choose to follow. And that includes myself, it includes Brian, it includes our elders, or anybody else you find yourself following through life. And this is especially important that we take these things into consideration because those we choose to follow will influence our decision as to which road we take. The people we follow will either lead us to life that is eternally connected with God or lead us to death that is forever cut off from Him. So we must be careful to follow the right godly and kingdom-focused leaders. Now, as we close here this morning, I'd like to share a couple of Proverbs that emphasize Jesus' teaching here today and, and point us at, to the truth of both passages, of both pa pathways. 
The first comes from Proverbs 16, 25, where it says that there is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way of death. This is the broad, popular superhighway that leads us ultimately to destruction. But it also says in Proverbs 12, 28, that there is, a path, there is life in the path of righteousness. And in its path, there is no death. This is that narrow, constricted footpath that our Lord calls us to walk. And the reason that he does so is so that we can for, share forever in eternity with him. I pray that you're on the right path. But at the same time, I know how easy it can be to get off track. While we go through life, it can be easy to, to stray from that narrow path and find ourselves speeding down that broad road to destruction. And brothers and sisters, when you discover that you're going along with the crowds and pursuing the things of this world instead of Christ's kingdom, let me encourage you to take the exit and return to the tree. The Apostle Peter reminds us in 1 Peter 2.24, that he himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. On the cross, the tree of Calvary, Jesus shed his sinless, innocent blood for our forgiveness. And through that great sacrifice, he made us new people. We have been made holy and righteous once again through his blood. But along with that, he gave us a new purpose, a new destination, and a new pathway to walk. We are now called to live for righteousness. So as we stray and find ourselves again drifting onto the highway of destruction, repent. Change your mind change your heart, change your life, and change your direction. As a child of your Father in heaven, turn right at the tree. Choose again to walk the narrow pathway of life. Let's pray. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, all too often we find ourselves going the wrong way. We get caught up in the moment and carried away by the, the flow of the traffic around us. And, and the world and its desires capture our attention and they distract us from the pursuit of the kingdom that you've called us to. Now, whether or not we mean to, we, we find ourselves becoming more and more separated from you. And we know that is not what is best for us. And it's certainly not your desire. So Lord, we pray that in those moments that you will capture our attention, that you'll call us back to the foot of the cross. Help us to remember the sacrifice you made so that we might be your children and, participates, and participants in your kingdom. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for calling us your own. And thank you for your love. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.